Okay. You seem to be cutting in and out a lot, Julie. Sorry? Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. Um, thank you very much for joining us. The webinar tonight is all around uh, having data at your fingertips and how to best use, analyse and access that. Uh, we've got a couple of really good guest speakers lined up for you tonight, but before we get into that, I thought I'd just quickly cover off on uh, some housekeeping uh, for just operating the webinar system and that type of thing. So if, um, if you haven't realised already, you need to separately connect the audio um, for this webinar program. There's some instructions on your screen at the moment just to guide you through that process, but you would also have those in the registration email uh, that you would have received when you first signed up. And I also sent a reminder out earlier today just for some screenshots of this information as well. So hopefully um, you've been able to connect and join us. and. Um, you can also connect uh, your audio via your computer just by following the prompts on the on the WebEx screen as well. Um, what we'll be doing today is we will be recording the webinar and it will be uploaded um, to the MLA website for you to watch at a later date if you want to. We've allowed plenty of time for questions for tonight's webinar as well. So we'll be using the chat function um, in the in the WebEx program to collate and gather those qu those questions. So, and I'll be going through those um, in our breaks to ask our presenters. So, just to uh, make sure I'm not sitting here talking only to myself, would you guys be able to pop in um, your postcode or something about the weather in the chat function? Uh, that way, I'll know that um, at least I'm not sitting here just uh, chatting away to myself. Um, and then once we've um, wrapped up for tonight's webinar, we've just got a little bit of information about, you know, what's up next in case there's other webinars or events or conferences and that sort of stuff that you might be interested in participating in. So um, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce some of our guest speakers for tonight's webinar. And thank you everyone for sending in your postcodes and stuff. I greatly appreciate that. Um, Tonight's uh, webinar is basically focused around a bit of a case study. So we've had, um, I guess, the Nathan Simpson from um, down around the Dubbo region, a partner with uh, Hitachi to go through and effectively sort out some kind of system that's going to, I guess, solve the IT issues and monitoring system issues and so forth that they're having at their place. And this is effectively just talking through, well, what does that now look like? What have they been able to achieve? What problems has this solved? And I guess a bit of an indication from Nathan about, well, you know, was this worth it? Is this something that he'd recommend um, for other producers going forward as well to take advantage of? So, um, Zach, I will change and make you the presenter. And I've just unmuted you, Nathan, as well. So. Um, you hopefully will be able to start um, chatting away once you're ready. And Zach, hopefully it's transferring over to you right now. Yep. And perhaps if you guys just want to introduce um, who each of you are and I guess what you'll be contributing to tonight's webinar would be great. Great. Uh, I guess first of all, uh, can people see my screen? Julie, can you see my screen? Is that... Yep, yep. Just make it full screen and then we'll be able to see. Is that, sh is that showing the screen or is it showing the uh, next slide? It's showing the next slide as well. Is that better? Yep, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I guess uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Zachary Zeus. I'm the CEO of a company called BizCube, uh, and we're the strategic data partner of Hitachi in the agricultural space. And I've been working on technology solutions in and around the ag industry for more than 13 years now. And I'm uh, pretty excited to be able to show what we've achieved uh, with Nathan and Benjamin Farms. Uh, 
Presenting with me tonight is Derek Thompson. Derek, do you want to introduce yourself? I don't. I need to be unmuted. I think we can hear you. Oh, can you? I can. Yes, yeah, we can. Yeah, you know. Oh, good. Okay, it just shows me muted. Yes, I'm Derek Thompson with Hitachi Australia, and I'm responsible for our part of our social innovation business, which is all about using technology for the betterment of community and society in general, and our agricultural solutions that uh, we deploy here in Australia fall under that uh, category. And I guess, Nathan, do you want to introduce yourself, and then we'll kick into the presentation proper. Yep, yeah, sure. So Nathan Simpson from Bingen Bar Farms. Um, we're a family-based uh, farming operation uh, down in central west New South Wales, around 50 k's east of Dubbo. Um, our primary focus is to produce all the grains and fodder necessary to uh, sustain our feedlot. Um, we, we sort of finish, this financial year we'll finish 41,000 lambs. Um, we've got a really good relationship with TFI. All the, all the lambs end up in TFI, up in their plant in Tamworth. Um, and what we've been able to achieve with yeah, the Atashi guys and, uh, and Zach from BizCubed is a full traceability, basically, from the vendor's property. We don't breed any lambs ourselves. We source them all as store lambs from generally off-farm direct, but um, some, some of those lambs we do purchase out of yards and auctions plus and these other platforms that are available. Um, yeah, so we, we, we can, uh, down on an individual animal basis, um, tell an end customer, ultimately, that that lamb has come from this property, went through these paddocks or, or pens in our situation on our, in our finishing um, part of the business and then went to this abattoir, went into this box of meat and ended up on this customer's plate ultimately is what, uh, what the end game is going to be all about and obviously demand a, a pretty fair premium for that product. Great. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, before I hand over to Derek for the first part of the presentation, I just want to cover off on a little bit of an agenda. Uh, so what we're going to start off with is a little bit about uh, the broader um, um, Hitachi offering and why it's interesting to the agricultural space. Uh, then we're going to talk about um, the Vineyard Bar project um, and specifically how the project evolved and developed and, and a lot of the challenges we faced uh, we'll cover off. We'll, we'll sort of share uh, the, 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 the things that were challenging as we went through the process. Um, uh, and then we'll do a live demo and then we'll wrap up and talk about what the capability, what the solution uh, that we put in place now can uh, support going forward. Uh, and throughout that entire process, we'll be uh, taking, uh, we'll have little breakpoints for questions. Um, and if you do have a question, uh, please uh, do a chat uh, message to Julie and she'll sort of um, help um, moderate those questions to us so that it uh, comes in in a nice cohesive way. Right. Hey, Zach. Yes? Do you mind just speaking a little bit more clearly into the microphone or moving it a bit closer to you, if that's okay? Sure, I, I can. Is that better? Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so without any further um, uh, preamble, I'm going to hand over to Derek. Derek, do you want to move? Do you want yep, me to move to the next slide? Yes, please. Uh, yes, so for those people, we'll take just a few minutes to introduce Hitachi because if you ask anybody in a room what Hitachi do and uh, what we're famous for, you'd probably get as many different answers as there are people in the room. But we're a large global technology company. We deal in technology. We're not agronomists, we're not scientists, but we're technologists. And uh, we have about 800 plus companies around the world uh, dealing in all types of different uh, uh, technologies. As you can see, no, that's all right, Zach. Go Sorry one. about that. I've gone back. Oh, no, go to Joseph, the next one. All right. And for those that don't know, in Australia, we employ about 3,600 people and we turn over 2.4 billion Australian dollars. A lot of us may know us because of our TVs or uh, refrigerators and washing machines. Some that uh, know us because of our construction and mining equipment, which is a large operation, as you can imagine, here in Australia. But we also have a lot of information and telecommunication systems. We supply industrial equipment and power systems and hoists and all sorts of things in the industrial space, as well as uh, power systems and solutions 
Uh, and for those that have ever had a chance to get the Sydney ride, the public trains, the nice new uh, lines are Hitachi-powered uh, uh, train systems. And, of course, in the uh, around the country, particularly in Queensland and Victoria, we, we provide rail for uh, freight lines. But in Australia, we have something extra special, and that is uh, we have a smart agricultural portfolio and uh, we provide solutions taken from many different divisions to support the agricultural industry. Next. Then just to give you an idea of the size of Hitachi and where we spend our time and effort, uh, we lead the world in worldwide patents and innovative solutions. Uh, our business just in the IoT part was $5.4 billion back in 2015. And we have spent $2.3 billion in the last three years in R&D investments. And we employ over 16,000 people just in the IoT space. Okay. So where do we get to tonight is we're going to talk about Binge and Bar Farms. And that's the uh, solution that deploys our technology for the betterment of improving on-farm efficiency and taking the guesswork out of farming. Next one. So where did this whole idea came from? It came from a, an article in the title for this presentation in Feedback Magazine in December last year. And it was an article that was written around Binge and Bar Farms. And the key highlights that were in that article was that one of the goals is to take up to 40,000 animals to 50 to 52 kilograms live weight, you know, to get the right animal with the right weight at the right time and minimise our production costs. Some of the requirements, though, that the animals need to be fitted with EID tags uh, and farm yield mapping was already in use. Uh, the farm also had a lot of already existing tools and financial tools in place. But what was missing was the need to create a user-friendly single platform that can monitor all the on-farm data from an easy-to-use, simple application, basically to remove the guesswork uh, out of the livestock management and imp make improvements in the animal welfare and management. And that's what's summarised in that article back in December. Next. So what does that mean? So essentially, uh, Binge and Bar Farms had various applications in place, and that's the sort of yellow box there where they used zero for their farm financial package. They were having AgriWeb. Uh, they were using John Deere equipment. Uh, the performance beep solution from the United States and Cool Collect Sapien solution from Melbourne. So the object was to try and uh, bring about integrated decision making and data collection from all these platforms into one and so improve his farm management, documenting the product quality, improving the value chain and capturing new markets where they could have direct access and end up being price, uh, price definers rather than price takers. And to do this, we used our Hitachi Data Trust and Process Intelligence Systems, which you see at the top of the page. But as you see, there's a lot of other boxes around there. But Nathan, once he could see what could be gained, he started to invest additional resources into putting on-farm IoT devices, such as soil moisture. We started to get live access from my MLA, the data stream that comes from uh, the Wheaton Livestock website. Uh, we also added on-farm weather station and we started to combine this with the actual weather station in the BOMs. Next. So what we end up is we get a solution that is ready not only to do what needs to be done today, but it's enabled it for the future to be able to go forward. And this can help with improving genetic productivity uh, certainly have the tools now to be able to track animals to uh, implement fast response times for quarantine for biosecurity. Uh, we evaluate weight gain is capable through the feed program assessment. We have a price-driven animal management system available uh, using pricing grids and grain price to recommend days on feed and other productivity analysis as well as biomass-driven solutions. So there's a lot more that we can go to beyond what you'll see tonight. Yep. So but the binge bar... Or Sorry? You want me to take over from here, or...? Yeah, you, you want to do the binge bar journey? Yep. Yeah, I think that... that yep. So we kicked off the project um, almost 18 months ago now, um, and 
Uh, Mouse alone was the initial focus was on consolidating data sources, data sources into a sing, single command center to speed decision making. Hey Zach. Yes. Can you please speak into the microphone again? Yes, Julie. Thank you. I've, I've moved it and, and lifted it up. Is that better? Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so in Milestone 1, the main focus was uh, on consolidating the data sources into a single command center to speed decision making. Uh, one of the things we found in that first milestone was how challenging it was to actually collect data from a lot of the farm systems uh, that Benjabar was using. And that's something that has continued to this day. Um, and so to uh, facilitate uh, support for the better decision making that we wanted to deliver and the value we wanted to achieve with Nathan, uh, in Milestones 2 and 3, we expanded the focus to include some IoT devices and some IoT uh, capability. Uh, we partnered with New South Wales DPIRD to achieve that. Um, but as we um, moved into Milestone 4, what we found is the IoT installation had um, some pretty significant challenges and wasn't going to be able to deliver the value that uh, we were all anticipating and hoping for. Uh, and so we needed to shift gears a little bit, and we started looking at uh, the total solution and all the data we were able to collect, and what we discovered was that we could provide an end-to-end -end LAM provenance uh, solution uh, as a result of all the data we had collected, uh, except that we were missing one key piece uh, to the puzzle. So uh, as uh, Derek mentioned, when we started the project, uh, Benjamin Bar Farms was, already had EID tags in all the LAMs, uh, drafting through uh, Waybridge was a key part of uh, the, the farm management practice and in terms of choosing which animals went on what kind of feed. Uh, they did that, um, Nathan and his team did that by uh, either weight gain, or weight gain or weight categories. Um, but what we found is we could collect the data from the um, Waybridge and the, the different um, uh, weight sessions that he, they did, but uh, we, the information we got off the Waybridge was what gate the animals went through, uh, but it didn't translate into which paddock uh, the animals then ended up in. Uh, and so what we and we, so we went to Nathan and his team and said, "Hey, how do you know where the animals end up?" And he's like, "Oh, we've got this uh, notebook uh, up in the up in the, the uh, head office. So we just uh, recorded in in there at the end of the day." Uh, and so what we realized is we needed to co uh, collect that data in an online solution, and that then allowed us to have a complete animal provenance from end to end. Um, and that provides the core data profile, enabling many of the other solutions that uh, Derek just walked us through um, prior. Okay. Uh, Julie, are there any questions at this point, or sh should we keep going? Um, I'll just check in. So we haven't had any questions come through just yet, but please feel free to um, pop your questions into the chat function um, as we're going along, because we can... Um, we can address this as we're going through the presentation. So, um, sorry, someone just reminded to um, everyone to speak in the microphones and then we'll, they'll be able to hear us all clearly. Um, so other than that, I think we crack on. Okay. Was that last part okay from my microphone perspective? Yeah, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's all right at the moment, yes. Oh, sorry, we've okay. just had a question come through. So. How agnostic is the platform, and does it have STD APIs? I have no idea what that means. Hopefully, one of you does. Stand, standard APIs, yeah. Um, All right. So, <laughs> uh, the platform is actually designed from the ground up to be completely uh, uh, solution, data solution agnostic. Uh, in fact, one of the um, two slides back when uh, Derek was talking about Sapien and tool, Cool Collect uh, to collect the Waybridge information. Um, uh, Nathan actually swapped that out with a Gallagher solution uh, a couple of months back, um, and it did require a little bit of mapping, but the same features were able to be used from a Gallagher system as we were uh, we built originally for the Sapien solution. So it is uh, actually um, architected from the ground up to be uh, solution agnostic. But one of the challenges that we find is a lot of the source systems where the farms use to collect data um, are not as good at sharing their information as, as uh, is required uh, to support this. So uh, we've had to do things like um, download CSVs and upload them manually or acquire emails and those types of things is, is, is a big part of how we solve some of those uh, source system challenges. Nathan, do you want to speak to that at all? 
Yeah, probably just a little bit, just to clarify a couple of things, Zach. There's, <coughs> so when Zach's mentioning Weybridge, uh, what he means there is a sheep handler, so we weigh all of our lambs um, with a handler, uh, or you know, it's like an auto drafter. We use our particular brand that we use is Clipex. Um, so we, it's weighing the lambs, automatically drafting them into whatever we want, basically, whether it be weight categories. We've got five gates, so it'll split up into five different categories, depending on their weight or weight gain or draft by vendor or by breed or any of these sorts of things. Um, <laughs> and uh, when Zach was talking about uh, Sapien, so Sapien was a program that we used to manage the EID data to produce reports um, on specific lines of lambs or you know, how specific lambs went. Uh, comparative to others. Um, the, the, the actual uh, hardware and software that we used on the sheep handler prior to that was True Test Gear. Uh, um, uh, and only oh, be three or four months ago now, I suppose, we did change from True Test over to Gallagher um, purely because the, the indicator, so we went from an XR5000 True Test indicator to a, uh, what is it, the HRW, no. HWR5, I'm pretty sure it's called. No, TWR5 um, indicator, Gallagher indicator, it's just a lot easier, a lot more simple to use. Touch screen, big bright screen, you can see it from anywhere in the yards. Um, just, yeah, but basically a lot more, a lot easier to use. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically all I want to clarify there, Zach, yeah. And the transition from the, um, uh, the true test to the Gallagher, was that challenging? Uh, from our perspective, there was no challenges. It was uh, pretty straightforward. All we had to do was download all the data off the true test gear and upload it onto the the um, Gallagher gear. Um, that was it from our perspective. But certainly from your end, there was a fair bit better, a fair, a fair few changes that needed to be made. That the data presented itself in different ways, and that uh, provided a fair few challenges for Zach's team. But in in terms of at our end, it was uh, pretty simple, really. Yeah. Well, and, and from our side, once we had the mapping completed, it mapped straight into um, the overall system. There have been a couple of challenges with um, uh, the way in which some of that data comes across, particularly if um, an animal doesn't get scanned uh, on, a, on a, a way item, but uh, we're working through some of those issues now. Okay. Any other questions, Julie? Uh, no, that's... Oh, hang on, yes. Okay, we have another couple coming through. Right. Um, so this might be coming later in the presentation, but are you able to talk us through at a high level how you're taking the data from in the yard and ingesting it into the Hitachi solution? So how are you managing things like live connectivity, manual transfer after each session? How long between the sessions in the yards is the data then available on the platform? Okay. Yeah, we'll walk through. Nathan, do you want to speak to that? I was going to say, yeah, we can walk through in a lot more detail, but in terms, just to quickly answer that question, so what we're doing in the yards on a day-to-day -day basis is we complete the session. We, there's an app, a Gallagher app, and same with TrueTest um, on your iPad. We use an iPad. We've got an iPad in the sheep yards. Um, we download that app to the iPad, uh, sorry, download that session to the app on the iPad, and then we email that session to um, the, this particular email address that goes to Zach's um, uh, processing. Um, and then and I reckon it'll be around about 60 seconds, and that information is available to be able to map. So by the time you buddy, have a smoke and you know, <laughs> scratch your ass, you're ready to go again to, in terms of mapping it. Excellent. Is there anything um, you'd like to add to that, Derek and Zach? We, we don't watch uh, what they do in between the session mapping and uh, <laughs> uh, and sending it in. Sorry, I was laughing at the answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> the, the thing I would highlight is uh, we do focus on being sort of um, farm solution agnostic, and so we do have lots of ways of getting data in. Um, and so when we were looking at Gallagher and TrueTest, the, the Gallagher and TrueTest workflow, uh, we did partner with Nathan and his team to make sure that it was uh, seamless, seamless from their workflow perspectives uh, to get into the system. But also understanding that there will be times that some of those sessions that they do, particularly we have a, a process for handheld sessions as well. 
uh, where the RFID is done, the ID or the RFID uh, uh, collection is out in the, the paddocks where there isn't uh, connectivity. So that's part of why we separate from a direct connection to the system. So there's a follow-up question to that. Um, so if you're okay. So if you're gating based on weight gain, does the Gallagher system have access to the weight history of every animal? Yes, it does. Yeah, so um, in the, the TWR5, well, whatever the indicators call, I'm pretty sure it's a TWR5, it's something like that anyway. Um, it basically means it can record five traits. That's what the five stands for. But there's, it's up to 100,000 different animals, I'm pretty sure. It records, it's something like that, like the Gallagher people will be able to tell you for sure, but I'm pretty sure it's about 100,000 individual animals it can re record data for. Um, and yeah, so as long as you don't exceed that 100,000 limit, um, it'll have that history there uh, until such time as you clear it from the system, if that makes sense. And that's how you're managing the, um, the issue around the 100,000 and you just go through and do a clean Every once in a while. That's right. Yes. At the moment, we're getting close to a point now where we need. So what we do with our EID tag, we've got 50,000 tags in circulation, that um, and we reuse them. So they're non-NIS. They're just a management tag um, that we use. So when the lambs come on and we induct them, we put our tag in. It goes through the entire process, so we can track their performance through the use of those tags. And then the abattoir up in Tamworth cut the tags out for us and then send them back down on the next truck that's coming back to our place. So, um, and then we clean them up and reuse them, clear them from the system and reuse them. So the historical data on how those individual animals performed still remains in the system, but in terms of um, in our uh, you know, historical uh, spreadsheets and that type of thing, but in terms of on the Gallagher system, we then clear those tags out of the Gallagher system so that we can reuse those tags without it being confused about which animal it's actually seeing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. So one final question and then we might move on with the presentation, but um, Steve's just got a question for you, Nathan, about what the network is. Do you have a network set up on the farm or does your iPad have a SIM or something like how, I suppose, more just yep. about the function? Yep, so we had, we've got, we had up until about a week ago, we had almost no um, phone coverage on the place. Um, so we had uh, Yagi antennas set up that would, um, with phone booster kits, you know, all over the place, that would send to, uh, you know, directed to the tower. And, you know, so if you had one bar of 3G, it generally boosted to four to five bars. Um, we're pretty fortunate in the fact that there was a, a phone tower only constructed and, and put into commission last week. Uh, it's sort of 20k south of us, so that's given us. We've got probably we went from having sort of five to ten percent coverage to about 90, 95 percent coverage over the place now. Um, so that was pretty fortunate. But so answer the question, yes, um, our iPads have SIM cards in them. That's how we get connectivity uh, to the rest of the world <laughs> with the iPads um, mm -hmm. for this type of solution. In terms of our IoT network, which um, Derek touched on there before with the uh, weather stations and soil probes and, um, and tank monitoring uh, sensors on, that, that uses a LoRaWAN network. So it's its own independent um, network uh, that, um, yeah, it, it's called LoRaWAN, yeah. Cool. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we might um, move on with the presentation Zach, if that's okay? Yep, that's fine. So this, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through um, the solution and talk through how this actually occurs. So this is the landing page for what we're describing as the Vineyard Bar Data Trust. So one of the things that Nathan just mentioned is that um, the, uh, the Gallagher system uh, keeps up to 100,000 animals. Uh, but then they clear out the EID tag. So tracking animal performance over time um, gets lost in the Gallagher system. Uh, but what, what in the data trust, we're going to maintain that data forever. And so we'll be able to do uh, uh, traceability analysis and all these different analyses that Derek was talking about uh, into the future. And so this is sort of the landing screen where we talk about sort of the farm operations, provenance reporting, and other reports that we've built as a result of, of the work that we've done. 
And then we have linked that to some of the other solutions that um, support, that Nathan uses to support uh, the to support his business. Um, now, the big screen, and this is the screen that we um, used to um, uh, replace the manual uh, writing into the ledger, uh, is in the drafting session, uh, the gates, one, two, three, four, and five, the drafting um, rules, the session, and the drafting count. And then this is where he select, where Nathan or his team selects which, um, where the animals actually ended up as a result. And sometimes the animals get split into different amounts and go into a second paddock. Um, the, the key thing here is these colors uh, are actually a uh, reflect what's occurring in the real world uh, in that um, the uh, gates are actually painted these colors, and so this gives the, um, the, the team on farm a visual cue of what's going on um, as well. Uh, and this is an example of in pen four, the list of animals and their weights and the providence that they've had. So this is just one where uh, they were inducted at 32.5 kilos, uh, they were uh, backgrounded for a while, lost some weight, and then once they got into confinement pen, they put on some weight uh, for, for a while. Um, the next uh, slide it talks to sort of the challenges we had getting data in and out. Uh, and in this case, uh, one of the things that just surprised us over and over again is how hard it was to get data out of some of the systems um, that uh, were sort of the core operating systems or core um, farm management systems that Nathan was using. Uh, we kept having uh, discussion after discussion with different providers and different solution providers saying, hey, uh, can we get the data? And then uh, we'd get a, a to get feedback and, and they say, yeah, oh yeah, we're adding an API, it'll be ready next quarter, or it'll be ready next year, and uh, we haven't uh, seen any of those things come online, uh, even though it was a, an important part of this. So we've had to work around a lot of the issues associated with poor data sharing from a lot of solution providers out in the market. Uh, Nathan, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I don't think so, other than when we first sort of initiate the initial um, Reason that we um, even applied for a, uh, a um, yeah to the uh, producer innovation fast track was to combine a lot of these data sources into one uh, command center, for want of a better word, uh, that Hitachi could provide. Um, so that was the initial thinking about why we sort of first attempted this type of project, um, and it was a bit frustrating. We got basically halfway through, probably two thirds of the way through, really, and realised that almost none of the applications that we were using um, would communicate through APIs to a, another external source, if that makes sense. Um, so that was frustrating. So basically we got two thirds of the way through the project and said, oh shit, you know, this isn't going to work. <laughs> what, what are we going to do from now? And that's when we sort of, yeah, you come up with the, the Providence story and we said, well, yeah, we can, we can track um, the full story of these lands from, from where to go through the system. Um, that's probably all I'd add to that, Zach, yeah. Yeah, and, and I guess just as your, uh, um, just one bit of uh, learnings that, that I'd like to share is, as you're selecting tools and solutions, uh, just make sure that they're uh, designed or, or uh, are ready to share data and think, think about the, the data sort of independently of the applications um, that you're going to be, be uh, using. So you, so you want to think about the data as an independent uh, asset uh, separate from the actual applications that you're using. Okay. Um, and then I think um, just to, well, I, the next slide is any questions. Um, do you, should I uh, jump out and, and just show the, the tool really quick? Yes, there are questions at um, this point in time. Let me see. So maybe if you do um, you drop it and show everyone what you're going to show them and then everyone's got an opportunity to just um, type in their questions now while you're doing that. Yep. I'm trying to get out of the PowerPoint. Hold on. Okay. Uh, so this is the screen we showed before. Um, one of the things we'll just sort of highlight is uh, this is the, the feed pens, the feedlots that um, uh, that Nathan was talking about in terms of um, the activity on farm. Uh, we can see the total headcount, uh, average weight, um, 
and uh, different data as we go through there. Um, this is the session handling screen. Screen. So he's done all the sessions. So we'll just show uh, one that's been mapped already. Um, so this is sort of animals coming through. Um, so 50 plus. So basically on a draft on a weight basis. Um, and uh, paddock lambs. This is the the detailed provenance. So he can select which pen uh, or paddock, and you can see exactly what's happened with each, each animal on, on a weight-by-weight -weight basis or however he wants to see that. Um, and then one of the, oops, that's strange. Sorry about that. Well, uh, just back to the uh, landing, uh, we did do a vendor performance analysis and we saw that the, when the animals go on feedlot, the best uh, bred animals or the animals from the best suppliers had significantly higher weight gain than animals from um, the less, um, per, less high performing um, suppliers. And that's something that um, Nathan's going to use to go back to um, help um, his suppliers do a better job of giving him animals that are ready to put on weight when they come on farm for him. Um, Nathan, do you want to speak to that? It, uh, I, I don't think I'm going to bring that one up because I think it's a little bit commercially sensitive, but do you want to speak yeah, to that yeah, one? Yeah, so, so basically the crux of that is, um, we, so when the lambs first come onto the place, uh, we map, uh, as in, uh, through the, we induct them with the EOD, so we drench, vaccinate, um, run them through a foot bath if need be, and then we spin them around and um, weigh them and put their ear tags in. So that's our first data point, basically. That's when we start recording the data on the informa or on that individual animal. Um, we put the tag in, and part of that process is to tell the system that this tag number has come from this particular property. So the example Zach's got up there at the moment is the lambs, lambs that we only inducted uh, last Friday, I'm pretty sure it was, um, from Auburn, a yeah, property here in the Central West, um, which yeah, you can see there, and that's the pick number. Um, so we can then trace um, that, that report that um, Zach pulled up, we can do a report on the performance of vendors animals. So in terms of if we got 30 different vendors properties, no, sorry, stock from 30 different vendors on the property at any one point in time, we can pull up that report and it will give us a, a to the day current um, view on how those individual animals are performing as a, as a whole from that vendor, if that makes sense. Um, which is pretty powerful information because as Zach said, the difference between the top and the bottom is outstanding. Um, we're talking sort of up to 400 grams a day difference of the average of the stock from particular vendors, um, which at the end of the day is a massive bottom line figure um, that, that, that's different, yeah, so. Basically it'll give producers the tool to be able to <coughs> <laughs> look at um, uh, animals from a particular vendor and say, yep, I can offer a premium for those because I know they're going to do when they land on farm. Whereas at the other end of the scale, um, they, they, you're, not gonna, you're either not going to buy them or if you do, you've got to buy them at a really big discount because they're, um, yeah, they're not up to scratch sort of thing or they're not going to perform on farm. Um, part of, another part of the, the pretty powerful part of this tool solution is that we can pass that information onto the vendor so um, it's a pretty free-flowing process. We haven't done it as of yet, but the capability is there if anyone does require it or, or request it. Um, so we pass the information on about all the, those, that particular vendor's individual animals and how they performed, um, and possibly even against uh, in, an industry average or something. Like it would be, it'd be hard to do it, um, or commercially sensitive to do it, I should say, against individ other individual vendors. But certainly we could provide the information on that individual vendor's property against, say, an industry average or possibly the average of the stock that have been on farm or in the feedlot, for example. Um, so it's pretty powerful information. Like, and then the producer could, or the vendor could make decisions on, well, you know, it, it's not quite up to scratch. Is that a genetic thing or is it a management thing? How could I best um, go about improving that? Not only for us at the finishing end, but obviously for the vendor at their end. Like they, if they're producing more weight on farm as stores, uh, like pretty well all the all the stock we buy is on a cents per kilo live weight basis. 
so the the B double or road train or whatever it might be gets weighed, uh, gets te gets it um, it's uh, uh, bloody tear weight, loaded up with lambs, get a gross weight, and whatever that figure is, whatever the net weight is, will pay a, a dollar per kilo light weight. Um, so it's in the vendor's best interest to have as much weight on that truck as possible. Um, so yeah, whatever the vendors can do on farm to increase that is obviously in their best interest and it's in our best interest at the finishing end too because stock going ahead and stock that are doing well and have done well since they hit the ground perform a hell of a lot better in the feedlot compared to something that's had a bit of a setback or has gone woody. Um, yeah. Nathan, do you think, and, and this question was asked in a, another presentation, So, uh, but do you think it's genetics or something else that's driving the performance of, of your best suppliers? Yeah, I reckon it's about 60-40. I reckon it's 60 percent, um, I can't, phenological, I'm pretty sure is the terminology, but basically it's 60 percent management. So in terms of your nu nutrition, yeah, making sure that that you or goat or whatever <laughs> is on a, a rising plane of nutrition um, when they're in kid or in lamb. And then uh, obviously making, making, trying to guarantee that that, that happens going forward. You know, once the lambs or goats hit, it, it kids hit the ground too. You know, um, and then the genetics do play a big part. But I think management on farm is probably big, bigger. Yeah, as in that, that's what I said, 60-40. That figure's only sort of been plucked out of the air. It's not a scientific fact, but um, I think management on farm plays a bigger role than genetics do. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right. Um, back to the um, presentation. Um, we're sort of any any other questions, Julie, at this point, based on any of that. Let me just add there that uh, <laughs> it's really easy for someone to say, yeah, they need to be on a rising plan of nutrition, but in the current state of bloody Eastern Australia, that's bloody difficult. <laughs> I know, I know, I know as, uh, as well as anyone else that that's pretty difficult. This in our current climatic condition. Yeah, definitely. Um. A question for Nathan, I think. Um, this kind of system, you're obviously seeing a fair bit of value in it for your business and being able, even just being able to identify those consistently good performers versus poor. Um, is this something that you're thinking your suppliers, this kind of system would be of use to your suppliers as well? Like, are you in conversations perhaps with them to see some of this adopted? Do they see value in it as well? I do. There's a lot, a lot that don't. Um, mm. <laughs> um, I, don't I don't know how to say it without being, yeah. You know, I, I certainly don't mean offence, but a lot of guys are older. You know, like I'm talking 70 plus years old. Uh, the vendors that we buy lambs from, and those guys aren't interested in looking at the data of their lambs. Um, it's virtually, you know, once the lamb leaves their property, they happy days, wipe the hands, and away they go. But certainly some of the younger blokes um, that we buy lambs from year in, year out are keen and they want the data, they want data to be able to use it, to be able to you know, increase the performance of their flock basically, yeah. Um, in terms of value to us, there's enormous value to us in going EID. We probably haven't really um, capitalised on the value of this project yet um, in terms of the full provenance story. Um, A, because it's not quite polished, it's not quite finished right off. But it's, it's all but there, but we haven't um, market. We're going down the process now of marketing our own product in terms of our own lamb. That's when it will really, really um, pay dividends. Um, so we're yeah, talking about, uh, oh, there's a number of different options available, but uh, we're talking with TFI um, about some pretty cool stuff here in marketing our own lamb uh, through using the TFI network. And, um, and uh, yeah, and obviously, it's attracting a pretty fair premium for that product, yeah. Is that something that you think you would have pursued and gotten as much value out of if you didn't have this system? Um, well, basically it would be impossible without this system. So the, to hit the real top end markets um, in the, all over the world, US, China, Japan, wherever you want to go, the top end markets where they're willing to pay big dough for a product um, they're not interested at all unless you can provide full providence and full traceability over that product. So, and down to an individual basis. So, um, a lot of guys have gone into that market, and there's still a lot of guys in that market. They basically meet wholesalers, and they say, "Oh yeah, I bought all these lambs from from this area. You know, so it might be Central West New South Wales. They all went through this abattoir, but there could be you know 20,000 lambs or 20,000 goats or whatever in the consignment." and not one of them they'd be able to trace back to an individual property or place of origin. 
Um, that's just not going to cut it going forward. So we've spent a bit of time in Japan and China and um, and the US, and yeah, that's that's one of the big take homes that we, Kieran, my brother and I, um, brought home was that these guys are willing to have the cash to burn <laughs> in terms of they want to pay a big dough for the product, but they really need to know on an individual basis the the full story where they were born, where they bloody were moved to, or whatever. Um, which paddocks they went through, what they grazed on, what if they were in the feedlot, what was their consumption, as in, in terms of what did they actually eat in the feedlot, where, what truck they went on, what process they went to, all that type of stuff. And if, without, without this type of uh, provenance solution, there's, there's no way in the world we can achieve um, yeah, marketing a product to those particular niche top-end markets. Yeah, okay. So there's a, there's a heap of questions coming in now. Um, so uh, another one probably for you, Nathan. When you induct animals, do you track the brand or vendor on the Gallagher system? Uh, we do track the vendor. What was the first one? Brand, was it? Yeah, so brand slash vendor. So yes, I'd say. Yeah. But yeah, so there's no there's pretty there's bugger all lambs come through now. We haven't done any goats as of yet. But it's certainly something we're actually losing bitter on some, might have been some of the guys in the audience possibly that did buy them, but there was a pretty fair line of lambs that went up for sale at Mitchell there a fortnight ago. We had a crack at them just to see how they go. Like lambs are in bloody short supply as goats are, but um, we had a crack at them to give them a go, but um, we do. So when the lambs in our induction, as I said, they come through, get drenched, vaccinated, drenched through a foot bath if need be, depending on what the, you know, the, the sort of status of their feet are. <coughs> um, they then uh, come round, uh, generally speaking, I'll go out to the paddock for a week, settle down, because most of the lambs are weaners, as in they've just weaned off mum, off the ewe. They'll yeah, settle down in a quarantine paddock for a week, then we bring them in, weigh them, split them up five ways in weight categories, and that's when we put our EID tag in. So they're tagged from that point onward, in terms of, we, that's our first data point, so we're recording, Any t every time that animal's seen, from there on, we're recording its weight and where it's been and what it's been up to and what it's eating and all, any treatments, you know, drench vaccinations, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so when those, when that, as soon as that tag goes in, we're recording against that EID number, against that individual animal, uh, the pick number and the property name of that, uh, of that vendor that those, uh, that stock came from, yeah. Cool, thanks Nathan. Um, I think this is probably, or well, Zach or you Nathan could probably address this one, but, um, so there's another question come in from Anthony, um, which is just looking, so we've talked about production systems, connectivity, and then getting data into the command center. Does the command center all take, also take in things like sales data, such as kill sheets, et cetera, from customers? And is that manually, automatically, like basically how we integrate it, I guess, is it and where from? So in terms of from my perspective, um, the. What Zach can do, Zach and Derek and those teams can do is pretty well endless, um, but we are limited by what the feedback we are given from the abattoir at this point in terms of a kill sheet. So the kill sheet comes out in a, um, it's just a table, like it's, it's, not a, it's not a CSV, it's just a, um, a table that you can't manipulate, therefore it's very hard to extract that data and actually make sense of it in, in, in a, um, you know, an analysis type way. Um, but yeah, certainly we can add, like Zach will speak to it, no doubt, but Zach can, yeah, they can add and uh, analyze almost anything as long as it's in a CSV type format. Yeah, so the, the kill sheets come back as PDF. We have requested from TFI um, a more uh, machine readable format. Uh, I think when we first started the project, um, that was less viable. I think in recent conversations, we'll probably be getting uh, the kill sheets in, in, in a more readable format. Nathan, because like, you've made some pretty significant progress with TFI recently, right? Yeah, definitely. So we're down in Adelaide last week and had a meeting with them, and uh, basically they're very frustrated. So they're, they're full of bus, like you've got to feel for them a bit. They, their flagship abattoir burnt down last year in Murray Bridge, um, and they've been in basically panic mode since then, working out what the hell they're going to do with stock and what they're going to do going forward. Um, they made the decision only about a fortnight ago to build a brand new premises um, in Murray Bridge again, down South Australia. Um, but so now they've been focused on that virtually for 18 months. Now they're to the point where they've 
uh, made their decision, they know what they're doing, they're proceeding, they're going forward, and now they're looking to upgrade their other plants. So six months ago, they weren't interested in talking to us at all about any sort of technology going into the Tamworth plant. That's completely changed now, and they they reckon within months we'll have hook tracking and uh, Dexter and that type of thing in the in the Tamworth plant, which um, will just it'll fill the next gap in the chain in terms of providing that full provenance story um, for for our share. And and also that will be more data flowing back our way from the carcasses. So the individual carcass data with Dexter, so there'll be <coughs> lean meat yield and this type of thing, um, intramuscular fat scores. Uh, which is obviously directly related to eating quality, and um, and yeah, obviously to to process that, it can't be a PDF. It's going to have to be CSV of some format. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like that's going to completely transform the system again quite shortly. Yeah. Um, it will, Julie. It'll, it'll just add that next layer. layer you know, like yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so next question. How is all the data collected and connected? Does the information go to a centralised centralized address, which is then analysed and put up into a single screen using the Hitachi platform? So yes, I would, yes, there is a dashboard, but I mean, do you guys want to sort of explain a bit more in the background? Sure, so the, what we have uh, underneath the covers is what we're calling uh, the data trust. And so data can get there in a number of different ways. It can get there via API, which is basically the data trust pulling uh, the API calls on a regular basis, uh, and that's monitored. It can uh, be sent in via email. So the Gallagher data comes in via email. So uh, Nathan's team forwards it to a specific email address and we read that email and uh, download the CSV and upload it into the system. Um, we have partnerships with third-party data providers as well. So um, part of the John Deere connection was saying we'd, uh, we'd uh, accept their API terms, so that means we can collect their data from now on. Um, so basically, um, it's a centralized data store. And the reason we're calling it a data trust is because we, we view uh, the uh, way in which we're collecting this data will outlast most of the uh, systems and processes and tools that currently exist on Binyabar Farms. And the data itself will outlive, uh, and the value of that data will outlive some of the, the systems that are put in place. So uh, we anticipate that Nathan will uh, use this provenance data to continuously improve farm operations from now well into the future. And this data becomes a key input to that continuous improvement program. And so it's a centralized data collection hub uh, is kind of the way I describe it. Cool. So do you want to talk through, so we've just got some questions around, well, what sort of things are contributing data to? So, um, you, you know, you, you mentioned soil moisture monitors. Are you, do you have uh, water monitors on troughs, water tanks, that type of thing, and does it all feed into the platform? Yeah, so it does. Um, we've got so the soil moisture probe. We've got three soil moisture probes in sort of three different soil types on the place. Um, they're supplied by John Deere. Like so, they're John Deere moisture probes. Um, they do. They come into the um, the data trust page, like the home page there, so we can view that data um, all on here. Um, and of yet, we haven't built in any analysis in terms of what that what we may be able to do with that moisture. Uh, in you know, with that, um, of the data, I mean, what's coming in. So in terms of, I can look at it and say, right, we've got X, X millimetres per 100 here, we've got X millimetres per 100 there, and then make an analysis just in my head on, right, I that means it's too bloody dry to go and top dress that crop, so we'll forget about it. But there's, in the future, we're planning to build all sorts of analysis, into, automatic analysis into these, into these data feeds coming in. Um, but there, yeah, just it hasn't, it's not there yet. But it, it's all that sort of stuff's capable. Um, there's in terms of our IoT networks, so we've got tank, all, uh, the tanks are hooked up. So we've got a reticulated water system, so we can pump from three different water sources into one reticulated system. So there's about ten different tanks on the place that reticulates. But through gravity, we're a pretty undulating country. Through gravity, down to water troughs in each of the paddocks. Um, so, yeah, we don't have any sense in trolls yet, but it's certainly something in the next few months, before summer anyway, we'll, uh, we've got a few paddocks where there's problem areas, like, as in the, uh, consistently we have water issues in these specific paddocks, so we're going to put some sensors in there that'll tell us, A, whether the, 
the trough is wet or not. So yeah, if it, we've got a block float or something like that, it'll go off and tell us that there's no water in that trough. And the other is um, a flow meter. So we potentially have, we, will, we will have flow meters on these troughs um, that will tell us, basically in a roundabout way, it'll tell us water quality, whether it's good or not. So if there's say 500 lambs in this particular paddock, or say 100 to make it easier, if there's 100 lambs in this particular paddock, it's 45 degrees outside, they should drink 8 litres of water a day, that should be 800 litres of water a day going through that water trough. So we know that if, if, it's, if it's back to 400, 50% of where it should be, there's a problem with water quality, whether it be algae or um, whether you know, they've stock about their bloody hooves in the trough and messing it up with you know, mud and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, it's become too turbid. So that's, that's when an alarm will go off. Um, basically, we'll go out to, the, to that particular paddock and flush those troughs. <laughs> Prior to having this system installed, we um, had to it, take a full day. We've got about 160 odd water troughs on the place and take a full day every week for one person to go around and check all those water troughs where the stock are. Um, a, looking at water quality, making sure the algae and turbidity is not an issue, and then B, just obviously just making sure there's water in them too, because we have all sorts of problems with pipes burst, whatever, rocks go through them, buddy, floats get stuck, all that sort of shit, blockages from calcium and these sorts of things, you know, can occur and lead to... Uh, yeah, a water trough not having water, and then obviously in a, in a heat wave like that, if you've got stock with no water, they can crash pretty quickly, yeah, which costs you a hell of a lot of dough. But all of that, Sorry, uh, all of that does feed into this central central uh, data trust, yeah. Yeah, and so simply through this this system, you've actually saved an entire labor, labor unit, um, you know, one day a week, plus all the costs of fuel and everything else just going around you know, checking everything. So that's a good saving right there. Are you guys using, um, so there's a question about how you're using, actually before we get into the further questions, if anyone does need to log off, that is okay because we will be, we are recording your webinar. There's heaps of questions streaming through and not a great deal of presentation left. So if, if everyone's comfortable, then we'll just keep um, going through the questions because there's a huge amount of interest. Um, and then if you do need to log off, then we'll have this webinar uploaded in the, in the next few days and you'll be able to log back on and just watch the rest of it at your, at your leisure. Um, so the next question is just around how are you using the John Deere systems and are you using any drone and satellite imagery as well to feed into this data trust? Yeah, so we are, so John Deere system, it's uh, all, basically all of our equipment is John Deere. Um, even like, you know, a spreader that we've got a fertiliser spreader, it's got a John Deere dry rate controller on it. So virtually all of our equipment is John Deere stuff. Um, and so it, all the machines are exporting data to my John Deere, it's called. It's a, um, you know, basically, a, it's a cloud-based solution virtually to, to accumulate all the, all the data coming from John Deere machines. And, um, yeah. yeah. It records, it, like I said, basically records everything coming out of the machine. So there's, in the header, you've got yield data, um, tractors, we can, uh, it's recording fuel consumption, all, like, there's all sorts of reports we can pull out of it um, in terms of, of virtually anything we want. We can create prescription maps, so using our yield data, like historical yield data for specific, specific paddocks, um, overlaid by elevation, overlaid by uh, soil test results, we can, uh, can come up with a, a, a variable rate prescription map for our fertilizer applications. Um, and we're using, there's a, ver a machine called a Verus. Uh, it's a bloody little three point linkage tool that you chuck, put behind a tractor. There's a bloke from Marywell, Jack Kerrigan comes over and he drives about and he takes pH samples. So a lot of our soil is pretty acid here. We're pretty, he like generally pretty heavy red clay loams. Um, uh, but it varies a lot. Um, yeah, we could have eight different soil types in one paddock, but generally speaking, it's a heavy red, red light clay loam. So pH is a bit of an issue. So we, this virus takes pH samples all over the paddock, um, produ produces a map. We then go out and uh, uh, ground through what the, the map says, uh, just to guarantee we are looking at the right thing. Once that's all done, we zone the different areas up. So there could be up to five. You could do more, but it sort of gets a bit complex for the machine. But 
um, yeah, we generally grab five zones in a paddock. The, the bottom end of the zone could be zero tonnes per hectare, the top end could be five tonnes per hectare, and everywhere in between, depending on what it might need as a result of those um, uh, ground truthing test results. And then we go out the track, send that from my John Deere into the tractor. Yeah, all the operator does is load the bloody load the spreader up with lime, and away he goes. And the the belt speed through the John Deere dry rate controller changes to apply the different rates that we've specified that we require on those specific zones once he once he reaches it. And that's all done through a GPS, obviously. Yeah, but so that's how we use John Deere. Um, what was the back end of that question, Julie? Sorry. <laughs> um, just a question around whether or not you're using any drone or satellite imagery in that sort of oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we bought a drone, uh, just a little HPI. No, was it H? Whatever they are, um, Chinese drone. There a couple of years ago, uh, uh, Phantom Phantom Four Pro it is. Uh, with the idea of yeah doing some mapping like crop mapping to be able to ascertain to come up with a variable rate for uh, urea top dressing map and as it turns out since we bought the drone and the friggin spread it hasn't rained so we haven't had a need to do that but um, we, that's what we will we will use it for that it's it's a basically a small entry level drone yeah it costs about sixteen hundred bucks or something that's bugger all plus a, plus a few extra batteries but. Um, so yeah, we do. We have, we will use that for that. But in terms of a, a bigger, larger scale type thing, we do. Um, we're sort of partnered there with uh, Phil Tickle from Chibo Labs, C I B O Labs, um, and he is his game basically is using satellite imagery to estimate biomass in paddocks, so pasture and crop biomass uh, in specific paddocks. So um, he's, yeah, well, we've done a fair bit of calibration over the last sort of 12 months, I suppose. 12 months ago, we were pretty inaccurate in terms of what the satellite was seeing was quite different to what was physically in the paddock in terms of uh, kilograms per hectare dry matter um, value. Whereas now we've sort of been calibrating over the last few months, oh, yeah, 12 months, and it's very bloody accurate now. Uh, I was actually at a mate's place down in... Um, at a place called Meningi in South Australia there last week uh, out of Derry and, th and they're using the, uh, this, the same solution. Well, actually, there was a film day about this same sort of solution from, from Ch Cybo Labs and um, they were amazed at how accurate it was. Like, they were within 10 kilos to the hectare compared to what an agronomist estimated there to be. So, um, yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. So that, that all pulls into here. So e each one of our paddocks... Um, you know, we know how many hectares it is, we know how many arable hectares are in the paddock through our John Deere machine data. Um, so we can then estimate, uh, you know, through the satellite imagery, we'll estimate how many kilos a hectare of pasture are there um, and how long it will last given these, you know, the, the stocking rate that is, that's there now. And into the future, we don't have the capability yet, but it's, it certainly can be developed. We'll use the, the information coming from our soil moisture probes to then forecast what sort of pasture growth we should have in the next 30 days, say. Cool, thank you very much for that, Nathan. Um, we, there's still lots of questions. Most of them, I think, are going to be for you. Um, but just to give you a bit of a breather so you can have a glass of water or, or something. Zach, did you want to... Another beer. <laughs> Another beer, nice. Did you, Zach, did you want to perhaps continue on with part of your presentation and then... Uh, Nathan can wet his whistle and we'll kick kick off with the rest of the questions. Sure, and this is part where I actually hand back to Derek. So Derek's been pretty quiet. Uh, Derek, do, do we still have you? Yep, sure do. Uh, do you want to sort of wrap up and, and talk about the, the next slides? Uh, yeah, I think uh, this last slide here, what else can be now be done? <clears throat> I think Nathan's actually answered a lot of that through a lot of the, the questions that have been asked. And it basically, as Nathan said, you know, it's sort of like the sky's the limit. It's really down to what works for your farm and the creativity with which you can use the information. And Nathan's going to continue with the rollout of the IoT network and add additional sensors, uh, as he said, to get a, you know more information from the troughs and the, the pumps and to be able to control them as well. Uh, that allows us then to work collaboratively with Nathan going backwards to work out what decision-making parameters come together to allow him to make better decisions. We don't sort of work on that in, in a vacuum in isolation. We work with Nathan to take that information and making it meaningful in the decision-making, somewhat akin to the way 
Zach has described how we came about to do the whole providence from on farm from the sheep coming on farm to to leaving. Uh, also, too, we're going to look into the, the documentation for the high value export market demand for traceability. Look into the various protocols and requirements and be able to document that uh, for Nathan. So there's a lot more we can do. You know, the top one's uh, camera analytics, and that's an interesting one that was mentioned because of animal theft and being able to, uh, you know, be able to what most people think is read license plates, but there's more to it, and we have a lot more analytics around that where you can have uh, license plates that are on a, a uh, go no go list. To, we're able to track the the uh, uh, the you know rogue sort of vehicle while it's on the farm. There's a lot you can do to it in the background with camera analytics more than just read the license plate. And this is really going to be for not only just animal theft but also to you know uh, improve bio biosecurity and animal uh, husbandry as well for the for the animal. There's a lot more you can do. It's just really now working through more and more information uh, to decide what is the best things for the next decision-making level. And that's really about all from the presentation side. Cool. Thanks very much, Derek. So it very much sounds like it, it's really about you guys perhaps having a discussion with the producer about well, what exactly are you after and then being able to customise something from that. Um, and I suppose the key thing too, like Nathan was saying, is that you're collecting some data at the moment that you're not quite sure what to do with in terms of the things that was to do with the soil, soil moisture monitors. So I guess it's, it's striking that balance with you guys about the um, do we still need to collect it in the short term? Well, just on that, it's pretty, um, as long as you sort of architect um, correctly, it's pretty cost effective to collect the data and to sort of, um, sort of put it into the, the trust um, for future usage. Um, yeah. Where things get uh, challenging is when uh, supply, uh, application suppliers don't do a good job of sharing or where the analysis requires something that's not collected electronically. So uh, th those are kind of the places where, where it does get challenging to, to figure out how to uh, deliver value, but um, uh, we, we can work around both of those usually. Um, but we work collaborative, collaboratively to find, the, to find the places where there is a meaningful data set that we can use to help make uh, a value outcome for that. For that, for that. Mm. So, and Steve's just um, question, you know, there's still human input required to transfer some of the information to a more suitable format. And I'd say that's definitely true, but becoming less so by the sounds of it, um, particularly as things like TFI are transitioning and changing their systems as well by the sounds of it. Um, did you guys want to add anything to that or? Yeah, there are human inputs, and, and I mean, basically, the human interfaces will exist almost any time there's a human process that also exists. So, when uh, Nathan's team drafts the animals, there is also the human step of taking those animals and putting them into a paddock. And so, you need to sort of capture that human activity in the system as well. Um, and then what we will be doing over time is, as uh, suppliers of these solutions improve, as partnerships improve across the value chain, is we'll be automating more and more. But ultimately, as long as there's humans involved in the process, there will be human activity to, to track it. Cool, thank you. Well, there's two or three questions left. So if any of our, um, any of our attendees uh, do have any further questions, please pop those into the chat function. Um, so um, there's a couple of questions more around the genetic side of things, Nathan. So from the data and information that's being collected in the analysis, are there any indications at the moment as to which breeds are performing better? Is there uh, is the variation between breeds bigger than between individuals? Um, not really. At a breed level, there's bugger all difference. So we were surprised to see when um, Zach first showed us, we were down in Sydney at the time, would have been about two months ago I suppose, 
um, he first showed us the uh, the vendor report uh, or the report of the land's performance by a vendor, I should say. Um, we're pretty surprised to see that dorpers were actually up the top, but in the same breath, dorpers were also at the bottom. So they were literally the best performers and they were also literally the worst performers out of the stock that we had on farm at that point in time. Um, so, and all the first cross and second cross lambs and merinos are in the middle type thing. Um, if you have a look at the report today, the, we've got two lines of merino weathers that we bought, uh, I mean, that would have been September last year. Um, we, then none of them are left on the place now, but that, they are the worst performers over the, last, over the, worst, over the last couple of months. Um, so yeah, that, no, there's no real correlation that we've put together yet in terms of this breed is going to be better than that, that's better than that, that's better than that. It's, uh, it more comes down to, like I said before, I reckon it more comes down to the, how, how those animals are managed on farm and just guaranteeing that they've got a rising plan of nutrition virtually the entire way through their life, you know. That's, that's my take home in terms of having, you know, having viewed this day over the last 12 months or so. That's, that seems to be the biggest, um, the biggest game changer, not necessarily breed or area or any of that sort of stuff. It's um, yeah, how, they, how they treat it on farm, yeah. So this is a question for um, Derek and Zach, um, just around whether Hitachi does anything in the genetic space. And I'm assuming you guys will double in wherever there is data being collected that potentially can be aggregated up into some sort of interactive, informative format you guys would be would be interested in, I am assuming, but not you don't have a specific genetics program or something like that that you're running. No, we don't. Uh, we ourselves, as Itachi, don't do the bioscience of things, but we work with a lot mm -hmm. of local partners to to look into ways of monitoring and recording in the data and information. Some of this work's being done on universities at the present time, uh, and so we've been talking to some universities to be able to provide a, a data solution that can meet their needs to be able to handle a lot and lot of data around the uh, genetic side of the uh, uh, business. Cool. Um, Anthony's got a question just around, um, are you able to provide any indication around what sort of investment has been required um, for this as a one-off implementation and then ongoing as well? I should say too that um, so this project had come about um, at, through partnering with um, the MLA donor company, which covered a portion of, of the cost as a part of the producer fast track program. Um, so Nathan did uh, certainly contribute some of his own hard-earned cash, and some of it came uh, from the federal government via MLA. So um, I guess did you guys want to have perhaps share some general figures potentially around sort of the one-off implementation costs and then, you know, maintenance, I guess? Yeah, Zach, you could probably talk to that a bit better than me. So basically up till this point, up till, um, well, the 30th of June yesterday, um, it's, we've been working under the same contract that we engaged we were all engaged in uh, with MDC um, back in, in 2018. Um, that's finished up and now uh, between BizCube, Tatashi and, and Benjamin Farms we've got a, a commercial contract uh, going forward. And um, the, 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 the price will vary depending on the level of service that we require, basically, yeah. So, so and, and what that will ultimately come down to is the number of um, questions that Nathan wants to ask of his data and, and who back sits behind the answers to those questions. So we'll charge him um, for the hours it takes to build it, um, but he will only do it if we can see, sort of have straight line uh, uh, the value that it will deliver. Um, so as we look at sort of upstream hook tracking coming from TFI, um, because that sort of uh, is what will enable the um, targeting the export markets, um, we'll identify what it will cost to integrate that data, but there will be significant value on the other side in terms of uh, higher per um, uh, higher price per kilo um, over the hook. Uh, and so what we're trying to do um, 
and basically what we're trying to do and part of the purpose of this uh, conversation is uh, look at what is general purpose about this, this solution. So the provenance component is something that we can, as long as people have EID tags and uh, some sort of uh, drafting mechanism, that um, provenance piece is pretty portable. So we can offer it to other farmers uh, at pretty low, low costs. And so what we're trying to do is turn this into an industry solution around provenance uh, so that people can, um, so that the cost per farm is um, uh, cost effective. Derek, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, you, you've summarized it quite well. You've summarized it uh, quite well because the price is variant depending upon what the needs and the challenges are going forward and the type of solution you're, the, the customer is looking for. That's why we work sort of backwards. It's not one size fits all. It's, it's sitting down with the, with the user and working backwards. What is important? What needs to be done? What's the immediate gain that can be had? And then working backwards from there. And as Zach said, the basics to get the things up and running uh, can be really easily multiplied. It's, it's that fine tuning part that uh, when you see extra value or things that will help you is that then when we sit down and work out, you know, what it, what it needs to do that. Cool. Thanks, guys. I'd say based on Nathan's enthusiasm and his, what he's been saying tonight, that um, certainly without putting words in your mouth, Nathan, you, you see value in this system and it's giving you return on investment. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, we haven't seen, haven't seen the real big upside just yet. Uh, that will come when we can uh, get market our product uh, you know, to that top end market overseas. Um, but yeah, certainly even on a day to day basis where there's significant value there, look, just, just down to the simple things like identifying stock that aren't performing well, you know, and um, uh, by vendors. So you basically have a, have a blacklist of uh, vendors that you never buy those stock off because you know they're going to cost you money. They're not going, there's no chance in the world of us being able to finish those. Um, economically, you know, so they're just just something you completely avoid. Like that, that at the end of the day, that makes a pretty significant um, bottom line difference, you know. Um, and then obviously chasing those top end guys, the, the ones that are really performing well, um, chasing them, and uh, and you know even paying a, a premium to be able to secure those stock because you know they're going to do the job. That that's worth a lot of dough to you. Uh, well, it's worth literally four times as much as the bottom end. Um, if, if bottom end is zero profit and the top end is four times that, you know, and it's all because of this data analysis that you're able to pick that up, there's no gut feeling. Um, you, so we actually had we actually had quite a few gut feelings coming into yeah prior to this uh, sort of data analysis, like oh yeah these dorpers they're bloody no good they haven't been doing great even though we had all the AID tags in, we didn't have a system that could analyse all that data and and produce the reports that we're after. Um, the same thing stuff we're using. Same thing guys do a great job, um, but it sort of didn't. It's not really tailored to our what we required. It's designed to for a stud with a relatively small number of animals that um, they're, they're keeping a really close eye on. Instead of in our situations, it's a relatively large number of animals that all we, basically all we need to know is their weight and their weight gain, and their, their breed and their vendor. Um, but uh, this, this you know, uh, basically solution that we've been able to develop, it, uh, it's very flexible in terms of what it can provide and the reports that it provides. And, um, and, and yeah, those reports uh, definitely have led to bottom line gains for us, yeah. And like I said, to really capitalise on it, like to get fair income in terms of being able to generate income from our investment will be, that will occur once we get uh, market a brand our own brand overseas. Um, a question, I guess, for the three of you. Um, what do you see is happening from here? Like, certainly this webinar tonight has been about explaining the case study and what's happened and trying to showcase to people some of the, some of the places you could go with this kind of system that's been customised for your business. Do you, is, is the plan then that something like this might be commercialised in some facet or where would you suggest producers start in their own journey of, of this nature? I'd personally, so on an individual um, you know, uh, producer level, um, 
I'd encourage guys, like it's different for the different areas, you know. I'm not sure where the you know, clientele are from here. It could be buddy Western Queensland or Western New South Wales most likely. But um, so it's a completely different ball game to what we're talking about. But I think still the same principles apply. But if you're able to um, tell that story about your product and, uh, and really manage your animals on an individual basis, you, you, know, you could potentially, I don't know what the, 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 the numbers are with goats, but you could potentially come up with a you know, breed for a, a doe that's going to you know, keep three times a year produce three kids a year or this type of thing, you know, there's those types of productivity gains um, that could occur by keeping close track of your data. Um, in the marine, like in a merino example, um, if, you, if you're breeding, we're not a breeding enterprise, but if, we, if you were, you'd be using this type of information to, to you'd be looking at, you're weighing your fleeces when you're shearing, so you'd be looking at, um, you know, fleece weighing and that type of thing and even micron, recording the micron of the stock, so you'd be looking at potentially uh, selecting ewes that you want to breed from that are producing, uh, say, seven kilo fleece that might be a you know 18, 19 micron or whatever, or even finer if you if you can manage it. And then, but then the other side of the coin, on the reproductive side, you want to be producing twins every time they lamb. So ultimately, after a you know after a breeding program of seven, eight, four, whatever, whatever years, you end up with a, a line of merino ewes that are going to produce seven kilos of 18 micron wool and produce twins every year. Yeah, you know, and that's that. You you won't get a better gross margin in agriculture other than maybe irrigating cotton than that at the moment. You know, um, that's the type of. But you can't do any of that without, um, yeah, looking at the individual animal data, basically, yeah, and recording it and keeping a close eye on it. You know, and and selecting for those specific traits. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing I think, um, if somebody wanted to get started on this journey. Um, they definitely need to have some sort of animal tracking, so EID tags of some sort, similar to what Nathan had in place when we started with him, um, and some sort of drafting technique to so you know how animals are improving and knowing where they're going as well. And then we can, uh, if you have sort of the drafting and EID in place, uh, we can pretty quickly and easily come behind that and, um, and provide the provenance solution to you. Um, that can be done pretty cost effectively. Uh, after that, um, sort of the the uh, we we can almost do any of the other types of analyses that we've talked about because actually tracking the animal, as Nathan said, uh, becomes the sort of uh, core uh, underpinning of, of the future analyses that we might do. From from a Hitachi point of view, uh, the solution is commercially available, but what we like to do is try to find a a way forward long term where we can help the whole industry improve the quality of the product and improve the quality of the reputation of Australian product overseas as well to help all farmers to be able to have access to to better markets, better premium pricing and also raise the quality image of Australian agriculture. We're doing similar things up in, in, in Queensland with uh, the beef industry and uh, have already started on projects that are along the complete supply chain and we're already working closely with processors to have them change their practices to improve their practices so that the uh, beef industry can supply the right animal to the right place at the right time and keep complete providence across the whole processing side and that's that's already well and truly underway in, in Queensland now, and we have to bring that same sort of solution working with Nathan to the sheep industry as well. And then, and hopefully one day goats. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, well that's, um, that's the question. But... Sorry, Zach. No, I was gonna say, yeah, absolutely. It's a, uh, the most high value bloody red meat you can get at the moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's true. Um, so that's it for the questions at the moment. I just want to say thank you so much to you three for, um, for making the time to sit down and, and talk through the presentation and all these questions for everyone. And thank you very much to all our audience as well um, for staying with us and um, for sending through so many um, excellent questions um, to us all. Um, Zach, I've just changed the screen back. so. Um, so you should be sharing mine at the moment. Can you see that at the moment? I can, yes. Cool. So what's next from here? Um, oh, so, sorry, I forgot one of the questions, which was just around um, where are you sourcing some of those and um, 
water sense flow meters? And how do you collect the info from them? Sorry, Julie, I missed the first part of that. So where are you sourcing the water sensors or flow meters for the troughs? Um, yes. And that's the, sense, that's the one where it's sending a signal to alert you once the water is below the sensor because otherwise you yep. will be getting alerts all the time. So you only get an alert when there's a problem. That's right, yeah. So currently, all that we've got, um, we, halfway through this project, we sort of identified that, uh, you know, adding an IoT network to this um, could be, you know, really beneficial. Um, it's sort of something that I'd thought about but didn't really know what it was all about, you know, 12 months ago, or a bit more than that now. But, um, yeah, we sort of got halfway through the project and went, oh, shit, this could be really beneficial. Um, so, through Derek actually introduced us to New South Wales DPI, the guys in Orange, at the Orange Research Station, and they, they were basically looking for trial farms to, to test some of their um, gear on. Um, so, yeah, we developed a relationship with those guys. They put some sensors, so we bought, we bought the weather station and the gateway, which is the gateway is the, uh, the communication hub between the, all the different sensors all over the place and uh, to the, the broader world. <laughs> um, uh, we bought those, so we own those, but the DPI donated or basically gave us um, four sensors for water, tr uh, for water tanks, so measuring, uh, five, sorry, there's five sensors there for measuring water tanks. Um, so that's what, to this point, that's what's happened, but uh, going forward, there's a company that we'll be dealing with called Taggle um, in Sydney, and um, they're based in Sussex in Sydney, in the, Sussex Street, sorry, in the middle of Sydney. And their, um, but their main game is water, all things water, um, in the uh, local government type area. You know, so looking looking after water systems in towns and cities for, for local governments, um, and that type of thing. And they, they, move, they do have an agricultural presence up in particularly in north North Queensland at Ayr and Townsville. They um, they've got a fair few uh, sensors up there that are sort of helping automate a lot of the irrigation systems up there for the sugarcane stuff. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be engaging Taggle, and there's actually another local company around here, uh, Discovery Ag, and their their branch, their little branch company that looks after IoT stuff is Galena, I think Galena Ag. So they've also um, submitted a quote for us to sort of to go over. So there's yeah, between Taggle and this Galena Ag, uh, but they basically provide the same sort of um, or very similar uh, services. Um, uh, yeah, it's just a matter of what, what we think will suit best, but um, yeah. Cool. Thanks, Nathan. And just a really quick question for you, Derek. What was the name of the cattle project in Queensland you were just talking about? Uh, <laughs> uh, the one, the, no, that one is, uh, the, the project is with MLA and is called Cattle, um, cattle Intelligence. And yeah. it's with ACC, ACBH, and uh, T. Cool. No worries. Thank you. Well, we might wrap it up there in terms of the questions. Um, look, from here, what we'll do is we're circulating an email to everyone who's uh, registered for tonight's webinar just um, with some links to some of the information that we've been talking about as well as a copy of the presentation. Um, we'd also love to get some feedback from you as well. So in that, there'll be a really short um, questionnaire that you could, you know, a couple of minutes just to fill in, just to let us know what's worked well, what didn't. Was this useful? Can you see any um, application for these kinds of technologies at your place? What do you want more information about? That type of thing. That'll just help us determine, you know, do we need to hold another one of these in more detail about something slightly different or, or things like that. Um, and two, I uh, just wanted to let you know, on the MLA website, on the events page, there's a whole stack of different um, webinars, uh, conferences, heaps of local workshops and, and events um, happening a bit closer to home that might be worthwhile checking out. So the next one's in a couple of days, which is just a webinar around um, just an intro to what's happening in the goat industry and the record prices they're seeing at the moment. There's another one next week, which is all around um, worm tests. Um, we've got a tech conference happening in Melbourne next week as well, um, which will tie in uh, well with tonight's webinar topic too. Um, and there's at least, um, I obviously work with the goat meat industry, so I'm plugging the goat stuff, but there's a, uh, there's a 
workshop coming up in Kalamala in Queensland in early August for goats and another three uh, around Victoria as well. But if, you, if you're after Business Edge or any other topics or, or workshops and that sort of stuff, they're all listed on the MLA website um, for you to have a look at. So um, what I'll do is I'll circulate all these links and information to everyone along with a link to where the webinar recording will be uploaded. Um, uh, Nathan, Zach and Derek, um, are you guys happy for me to circulate your emails as well as that? Oh, of course. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. problem. Excellent. Yeah, no worries at all, Julie. Yeah, cool. Excellent. I'm sure these guys, if you've got more, if you're mulling this over over the next few days and got other questions, please feel free to drop these guys a line. They're super interested in, um, you know, any way we can help at all um, and just helping you through this process. So once again, thank you everyone so much for your time. Thanks so much to our presenters. You guys did a great job and just looking at the volume of questions coming through, you nailed it tonight. Um, so hopefully this was really useful for all our, our attendees as well. So thanks so much everyone. I'll let you all go and um, finish eating your tea or, or whatever else you need to do tonight. Um, but stay tuned because we'll have more events and so forth coming up soon that we can let you know about. Have a good one. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.